Women of Substance, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. on this station. Well, this is a continuation of last week's edition where one of Nigeria's finest took us through her special moments from farming in Edo State to selling jewelry in Gata, that's in the heart of Lagos, while waiting to achieve her dream of being a sports journalist. Well, let's find out more about Mrs. Aisha Falode, a woman who followed the Nigerian team to Japan, uh, Korea 2002. And she made sure she got exclusives, one of which uh, changed the course of um, the uh, coaching career of one man. All of this after the break. I bring you greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Pisokunko, and you're watching Woman of Substance. God bless you. Women of Substance, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. on the station. So how easy has it been for you operating in this male-dominated area? What has the response been? And can you remember at any point where you have been badly treated because you were a woman? No. It has never happened. It has never happened. I told you when I, when I started, it was with a lot of skepticism from the, uh, my, male, my male colleagues. But as soon as they began to see that I, I was also in the game and ready to play, they gave me the opportunity and the respect. You have to really be hardworking. In Mali 2002, the Africa Cup of Nations in Mali, I had gone ahead of everybody else to get the arrivals of the team. That was one nation's cup that the Super Eagles of Nigeria and the way and manner they prepared for that competition was very controversial in terms of planning, execution, and even the performance. While everybody else was um, smaller countries were flying in their teams in chartered planes to Mali, the Super Eagles of Nigeria, captained by Sunday Ulisse then, had gone to play um, a friendly match against Cote d'Ivoire in Boake, Cote d'Ivoire. I was at the airport. I had seen Algeria coming in, their, in a chartered aircraft. I had seen uh, a couple of other smaller countries. countries. And there was this immigration that I was chatting with. And he said, your team is coming. I told them I went to for the Super Eagles of Nigeria. It's coming at, after midnight. And it, she asked me, why are they not coming in chartered aircraft yes. like all the others? Nigeria is a big country, you know. What was your answer? Of course, I didn't have an answer to that. They came looking tired, you know, um, depressed, unhappy, and all that. And that was the same year also that in any competition, Africa Cup of Nations, there's usually a general assembly. The general assembly is um, the hierarchy of and the leadership of FIFA is invited to to the General Assembly. And during the arrivals of everybody that came for that competition, they found me at the airport. I'm the last person they, they see before they go to bed at night in their hotels, just trying to get exclusives. And when they wake up in the morning, I'm yeah. right there. I remember there was a time President Blatter and Hayatu jokingly asked me, do you sleep? And I said, no, when you are awake, I am awake. When you go to bed, I should be awake. And they said, good job. It takes my mind to the first FIFA broadcasters um, meeting that you had in South Africa early this year. What exactly did you talk about at that meeting? This is the first time that Africa will be given the opportunity to host the World Cup. The, um, the World Cup, of course, is the biggest tournament organized by, FIFA. organized by FIFA. And there's a lot of skepticism 
up until lately that Africa couldn't hold the World Cup, which is why I'm very pleased and a lot of people will be shocked and amazed by what an African World Cup will be like in 2010. Because the organizing committee for the World Cup in, in 2010 know the, uh, the, the people's doubts about delivery, a world-class event. And they, they have worked hard. They have put up excellent structures. The facilities that South Africa will present in 2010, I can sit here and tell you with all confidence, will compare to none that FIFA has seen in the past editions of the World Cup. Are well, you at home with the preparations to be made? Do people have complaints that Nigerians are never prepared? They are always wobbling and falling to the finals. You see, when, you, when, when victory comes to you too easily, you do not appreciate it. Right. It is when you fight for it, when it is hard earned, you value it the more. We have traveled this road before. Before the 2002 World Cup, the first in Asia, Japan, Korea, we were second to the bottom in our group. Bonferri Joe was in charge. We had only two more games to go against Sierra Leone and Sudan, both away in Freetown and in Ondoman, when Amadou Shoaibo, the same coach now, was called in to rescue the team. He went ahead and won the two games. The one in Ondoman, emphatically. And that was how we went to the World Cup in 2002. Because at that same World Cup that you were, you had exclusives with the um, players, you were sending home reports to your <laughs> station at that time. One of the uh, reports cost somebody his job. Was that what you set out to do at that time? No, I was just. I was just there to report what was happening. That is the job of a journalist, and also investigate why those things were happening. Korea Japan was um, was very emotional for me. I was staying in the hotel, same as the team. We were eating in the, in the same dining, dining room. Of course, the only woman, you know. So there was this rapport between us. And of course, that was the time Taribo West was also going through his uh, marital issues, you know, with the marriage. I sat down with him for two hours. We were talking, not on camera, you know, as friends. He confided in me. He told me a lot of things about, you know, what was going on. What was going on. And I began to, you know, um, really have a different opinion and perception from what I had been told. I haven't heard from him. And, uh, you know, my respect for him at that point increased. increased. For me, as a journalist, it was a good outing for me. Following the team, about and also getting to know you know how the, the mind works for them before a game during and after and then also seeing them you know being with them in a relaxed mode where the focus is not the game just to chill chat and Tell have a conversation the that 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 was just a part of being you know being a journalist it was not my intention was not to get anybody out of their job sure. my intention was just to report what it is that was going on with our team in fire away uh, japan and i'm sure it's one of your memorable moments it is Def show. definitely let me shift your gaze now to the falcons they've not been able to hold their own outside this continent why exactly um, is, uh, is it that way? Even in the continent, the dominance of Falcons has been challenged. It's been long in coming. Um, we've always had um, a strong rivalry in women's football between Ghana and Nigeria. 
But even the challenge now is not from Ghana. It's from far away Equatorial Guinea. Guinea, Guinea. Yeah. The point is that the women's game, as in the men's game, is being, um, it's not been given enough, enough attention and care. A lot of people who have put in their money to sponsor the women club is um, they're doing it as as charity you know you're just putting money into the clubs without getting anything in return this is a women's game that does not enjoy any kind of sponsorship so that has kind of affected the game whereas where you have a sponsorship of the um, the Premier League that is for men in, in tune of um, billions of Naira, you cannot say the same for the women's. And I think that the, uh, the people who have managed the women's game before now, you have to have a business sense, you know, uh, a business orientation. To know what you're doing. To know what you want to do and have... Um, before you are given the responsibility, you have to have um, a strategy, a plan of how you want to turn it around. But I think a lot of people are just given the responsibility without even having an idea of what they want to do with the women's game, other than they want to travel for competition, you know, uh, they want to end their Esther code, not, not having an idea of what they want to do to increase the fortune of the of, of the women's game, and we have a lot of potentials. There have, been, there have been reports about um, sexual harassment in the camps of the um, female uh, football teams. Confirm to us that these kind of things happen, and it affects their output of competitions. You know, until these things are proven, they remain what they are. Rumors. Mm -hmm. I do not have any. Um, I do not have the facts, and I do not have the evidence to say that there is sexual harassment going on in the in the camp of the um, the women's team. If there are, it is not to my knowledge. Do you see them making it to Germany 2011? The women have been to every World Cup. They've been to every Olympic Games. They have won the Africa Women's Championship, which is the version of the Nations Cup, back to back for years, except this last one in Equatoria, Guinea. So if we must begin to reward athletes and players using performance as yardstick, I'll say the women deserve more reward than the men. So I think we, we need to address that issue. Because what is happening now is totally un un unacceptable and it is not motivational enough for the women. And remember, the needs of the woman is much more than the needs of the man. The women's game is professional in outlook and in administration at it, as it is. But the wages they are getting and the treatment it's not the same as what you have in the men's game. Would you say so we need to address that. Would you say it's because we live in a patriarchal society where if it's not about the man, then it's nothing at all? They say that the game, you describe it as, you know, it's football is a beautiful game. Sometimes they will say that the future of the game is feminine. So, you know, you look at this adjective and you see football as a woman, you know, that needs to be cared for, tendered, you know, pampered and all that. But in reality, it's the reverse in Nigeria. That is the case. So I would say we really need to have um, women who can enforce and begin to think of how you can turn the fortunes around for the game to be of benefit to women. Now, will we ever see a female commentator in Nigeria? 
it, it's, it's only a matter of time. This job is about breaking new grounds, really. That is one area I think um, the younger generation should be looking into, including I, who is talking to you. Commentary is a unique, um, I'm looking for the word to describe it. You are in a position to be the eyes of millions of audience at once in a game. Even though they are watching it, the narration and the description of the action on the field of play tells a better story. Tells a better story. So I think it's, it's an area we should, um, we should focus our attention on also uh, breaking new grounds in that. I'm Bimbo Oloyede, and you're watching Woman of Substance. Women of Substance, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. on the station. That's one woman who believes that the NFF is not what Nigerians think that they are. She says they have performed uh, to some extent. And she also feels that sports must be giving the attention that it deserves so that it can help with Nigeria uh, in its rightful position in world rankings. Up next is Frank Talk, where another woman who is so passionate about this country is saying it as it is. Don't go away.